Good evening, everyone. My name is Sunita, and I work here in Google uh, in University Alumni Relations. And it is my pleasure to welcome you today um, on behalf of Google. It's actually very exciting to have so many people here. We've been working on this event for uh, a couple of months now, very closely with the Columbia Alumni Association, the Columbia School of Engineering Alumni Association, and the Columbia Club of Northern California. And I think this was a, a great example of a, um, a fruitful and very nice partnership. So we are extremely happy to have you here tonight. Um, I would like to thank um, Neil Deswani, who will be our speaker tonight, because we actually owe him this event. The idea initially came from him, so thank you, Neil. <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, before kicking off this event, I would like to say just a few words about our partnership with Columbia, since this is obviously the result of a long-term partnership Google is building with the University of Columbia. Um, Columbia is one of our big providers of talent at Google. We have currently close to 200 um, alumni from Columbia working at Google. Um, about a half of them are here in the Bay Area, and uh, we also have a pretty good representation in our other offices across the United States, uh, New York City and other cities, and also internationally. We have a Columbia alumni in places like Great Britain, India, China, just to name a few. So it's, um, it's actually um, a, a pleasure to have you here. You'll see actually a few of our uh, Googlers from Columbia around. Some of them have Google t-shirts, so please feel free to, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to them. We'd have happy to you know, chat about what we do here at Google. Um, but our partnership with Google is not just about recruiting. As some of you may be aware, we um, at Google support very strongly um, academic research, and uh, Columbia is actually one of our strong partners in that area. So every year we offer um, a couple of research awards to faculty members from Columbia, um, basically to support uh, academic research in areas of interest that um, we, we have you know, mutual interest in. Um, and we also have a visiting faculty program. So we have a faculty member of Columbia working in our New York office right now. So it's been, uh, for a couple of years now, a very strong partnership on the research part. And we're very happy about it. It's something that um, works really well. Um, we have other projects that we work together with. I, I guess some of you might have heard about the Book Search project. I think it was back in 2007. Um, the Google Book Search team digitalized Columbia Library. So we have you know, all of the documents in the Columbia Library now available to um, internet users worldwide. So that was a great project and ex a great example of partnership uh, between uh, Columbia and Google. And we're obviously looking and continuing and strengthening that partnership moving forward. Um, so it's really a great pleasure to have all of you here. I would also like to w welcome warmly our other guests. I know that we have uh, a few guests from Cornell tonight, Stanford, Berkeley, uh, Carnegie Mellon, other universities. So welcome to all of you. I hope you enjoy the, this evening. And um, uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to have you here. Um, before I forget, because I'm sure I'll forget at the end, you'll find on your seats um, a feedback um, questionnaire. So at the end of the event, if you have a couple of minutes, we'd like to hear uh, from you what you think and what we can continue to do to strengthen our relationship with uh, your alumni community. And um, with that, I'd like to uh, hand it over to Alan Eng, who is the president of uh, Columbia um, Alumni Club of Northern California and who's been working very closely with us uh, for this event. So thank you, Alan, and it's to, up to you. All right. So what do you guys think of this venue? Isn't it awesome? I mean, it's, this is really, really great. Um, I'm so excited about the partnership with Google that Columbia is forging here, and um, I'm also just really excited to be here at the Googleplex. I mean, heard so much about it, and I think with that, we really want to thank Sunita Lafon. Sarah and the other folks at Google who put on this event for us. So I think they deserve a round of applause. Let's, let's give them a round, warm round. So um, as Sunita mentioned, my name is Alan Ng, and I am uh, president of the Columbia Alumni Club here in Northern California. And I actually work at a company that many might consider Google's top competitor. Uh, also has two O's in its name, and it's just down the street, and was also founded by two Stanford alumni. Um, but as evidenced by, the, by those that I've met, the Columbia alumni that I've met there at that company, as well as all the uh, Columbia alums that I've met here at Google, and the many of you whom I met tonight, uh, the Columbia alumni have a very, very strong presence here in Silicon Valley, in specifically, as well as in the Bay Area in general. We have, um, I believe, over 8,000 alums here, 
and the Columbia Alumni Club of Northern California represent all of you. Um, uh, downstairs on the registration table, you guys might not have seen it coming in, so I encourage you to grab one on the way out. But there's um, this sheet of paper, which has um, some of the upcoming events that the Columbia Alumni Club is hosting. We host more than 30 events a year, and the number one thing that I ask of you guys is to just check it out and participate if you have a chance. Um, there's a wide range of events that the organization puts on, um, from talks like this to happy hours to going to sporting events, uh, to going to Broadway shows. Um, it's just a really great way to meet other Columbia alums and to contribute back to the, to the uh, university community. Another group that helped put this on is the Columbia Engineering School Alumni Association. Um, there's, there wasn't a representative that could come here tonight, and I just want, I promised that I would say a couple words about them. Um, there, if you're an engineering school alum, you are a member of that, engineering, uh, of that alumni association. And it's unique in that it has its own endowment, actually, which allows it to be completely financially independent. It's over 100 years old. And uh, it puts on a lot of great events like this one tonight, uh, working with Google, of course, to make this happen. Um, one of the things that they just wanted me to mention is all the great things that that uh, alumni association is uh, working on on your behalf. Um, a couple of things it does is it gives away the Prentice scholarships to distinguished students. It gives away the distinguished uh, teacher faculty awards every year. Um, and it also puts on a fantastic event back at Low Library on campus that they want to invite you to. It's their annual awards dinner, and it's happening this year on November 11th. Um, so if you have a chance, um, they would love to have you back for that event. Um, they give away awards to the most distinguished alumni. And so with that, I think we should move towards the program at hand tonight. I want to introduce one of our distinguished alumni, Neil Deswani. Uh, Neil is an expert in uh, security, of course, which is why we're talking about security tonight. Uh, but he's also an expert in uh, wireless technology as well as peer-to-peer -peer networking technology. And we're just really, really glad to be able to work with Neil and have him come speak for us. Um, he has worked at a number of very distinguished Bay Area technology companies, uh, from Lucent to Yodli to Docomo, and of course here at Google. Um, he's also had a bunch of teaching positions um, uh, when he was a PhD student and, uh, and graduate of Stanford, and he of course also uh, taught as, as a student when he was at Columbia. Um, and the last thing I'll say about him is he is a published author. This uh, Foundations of Security book right here, um, one of the neat little facts about it is that the foreword uh, was written by uh, Dean Zvi Galil, um, who is the dean of uh, the School of Engineering at Columbia. So with that, I want to introduce Neil and uh, have him start the program. Great. Thank you, Alan. So for the tech folks, will I need this? No. I, I'll put this aside. So, so welcome, everyone. I wanted to uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking about cybercrime today. And I, um, I'm, I'm a really big fan of bringing... Uh, talented people together. So I'm really glad that uh, Columbia was able to work together with Google for this particular uh, event. Um, I'm going to chat for about maybe uh, 40, maximum 45 minutes, and then I'm hoping to have uh, some Q&A. Of course, if you have any questions that come up before then, please uh, just let me know. I was looking at the uh, set of folks that uh, registered for the event, and I saw a, a very good mix of both uh, non-technical as well as technical folks, and so my hope is that um, w as I as I um, tell you about some things that are going on, I will uh, hopefully be able to uh, appeal to, to to both of you. Of course, if there's anything that's uh, confusing or unclear, just just let me know. So I just want to give you a quick overview as to some of the things uh, I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to start off talking about data breaches. I'm going to talk about hacking, uh, and the t title of the talk is uh, "Protecting the World from Cybercrime." And so to protect the world from cybercrime, I'm going to talk specifically about three different groups. I'm going to talk about what software people can do. Uh, I'm going to talk about what Google is doing. And then I'm going to talk about what you can do to help protect yourself uh, from various threats on the internet. And in fact, before I get underway, I want to, how many, how many of you would consider yourself non-technical, doing something besides software? OK. And then the rest of you? Software? Yeah? OK, so about half and half. So that seems uh, quite reasonable. 
So being in the space of security, I have read press releases over the past four or five years. And after reading press release after press release of security vulnerability after vulnerability, part of me wonders whether or not the sky is falling. And let me provide some examples that may help motivate why I, I feel that way. So I'll give some examples from, from the past few years. Last year, actually just about a month after I published um, uh, my book, um, uh, a holding company called TJX, which owns TJ Maxx, Marshalls, a number of retail department stores, they announced probably what was the largest uh, cyber attack of all time in which over 45 million credit card numbers were stolen. What the bad guys um, basically did, and you, you might ask, well, how the heck did that happen, right? What the bad guys basically did is they took advantage of the fact that these retail department stores were using Wi-Fi technology to transmit credit card numbers from the point of sale station uh, where they swiped your credit card to their back-end servers so that they wouldn't have to deploy cabling, etc. And they were attempting to protect these communications using a protocol called WEP, the Wired Equivalent Privacy Protocol, that was actually built into the Wi-Fi standard, but the technology community and the security community uh, knew that this um, this protocol has been vulnerable for some time, uh, and uh, I guess uh, TJX didn't uh, really upgrade. So what this meant for the attackers is they could simply park their cars in the parking lot and or drive by the retail department stores, gather lots of wireless traffic, and due to various vulnerabilities in this particular protocol, if they gather enough traffic, they can reverse engineer the encryption that was used, figure out the key, and then decrypt all the traffic. And so the bad guys would do this for a period of uh, quite, a, quite a few months, even suspected out to be years, and they were able to steal uh, you know, a fairly large number of, of credit cards from transactions dating all the way back to 2002. So that's one example of something that went wrong. If you ever shopped at any of these stores, uh, I would highly recommend that you get uh, identity monitoring type protection uh, <laughs> for the obvious reason. Um, the, you know, th this, uh, this size of event isn't isolated. The year, the year prior to that, uh, there was a, another data breach that took place. Uh, this particular data breach occurred at the uh, Department of Veteran Affairs. Uh, so they would subcontract with a number of other uh, companies to help them with some of their operations. One of the companies that they subcontracted to is Unisys. And for those of you that are in the field, you know Unisys has been around for a long time. Uh, what happened is that one of the employees at Unisys took home a laptop and a hard drive that they were not authorized to take home. And what happened that particular night is that person's home got burglarized, and that hard drive that got stolen happened to have name, date of birth, social security information, address information, insurance information for 26.5 million veterans, which is quite a significant number. And of course, as per various uh, data breach laws passed by states, um, they were required to, to notify people. Uh, the employee was dismissed. The supervisor was, uh, uh, you know, resigned. It was a it was a big mess. So that's uh, another another example. Uh, a third example is uh, uh, an example that uh, comes to us from a company called Card Systems, whom many of us would just have never, ever have heard of. They were basically one of these back-end uh, credit card gateway processing companies. So whenever you swipe your credit card, there's a set of gateways through which your information goes through in order to authenticate the credit card number. So Card Systems was one of, such, uh, one of these such companies, and they had a database of about 43 million credit card numbers that they stored unencrypted, which um, didn't really big, become you know, a bigger problem until somebody at Card Systems decided to connect a website to that database. And so what happened is that the bad guys would go to Card Systems' website, except instead of you know, registering and choosing a username and password and or filling out other forms on the website, what the bad guys did is they started entering database commands into that website. Now, you'd think that if a site's well protected, it shouldn't uh, actually do anything with those database commands, but uh, in this case, it did. And as a result, what the bad guys were able to do is put a program onto Card Systems database, which told that database to email them a couple thousand credit card numbers 
every day. And this actually went on for about six months before card systems even noticed. Of course, once they did notice, they had to notify Visa and MasterCard. And once they did that, Visa and MasterCard canceled their contracts, their revenues went to zero, uh, their assets were pretty much acquired by another company. So uh, 43 million credit card numbers were exposed to the ad attack. Uh, approximately 263,000 were, were stolen. So these are some pretty spectacular events. Uh, in fact, if you, if you go back to 2005, there's a, uh, a website called uh, privacyrights.org that has uh, been doing their best to keep a chronology of all of these types of data breaches. And so uh, one, of my, one of my interns, uh, Arkajit Day, he uh, compiled all this information into to some nice charts. I've uh, shown one of these charts. And so what it shows is that since 2005, there have been there have been over 230 million lost or compromised records. And what the chart shows is how those credentials, how those customers' records uh, uh, were, were compromised. Uh, we can see from the pie chart that a, a majority of it was due to hacking. And I'll tell you what I mean by hacking, and I'll show you some hacking type of attacks. Uh, but that's uh, where a majority come from comes from. Uh, let's see, there are, there are other large parts of the pie that just comes from lost and stolen equipment. So this is, you know, bad guys breaking in, stealing a laptop that has a hard drive that has lots of uh, unencrypted information on it. Uh, or, uh, say an employee loses the equipment, that's kind of a bad deal. So uh, this, is, uh, this is the breakdown, and uh, this, is, this is how these things are happening. So. For the remainder of the talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the, the hacking piece of it and tell you a little bit about how some of these attacks occur, as well as what uh, we can do as a community to help fight them. So um, I, uh, I mentioned in the card systems case that um, you know, the bad guys kind of broke into the website. Let me show you a little bit about how that type of an attack is, is done. <laughs> Uh, some of you that are technical probably have seen this before and, and may realize how this works, but you could imagine that a website might want you to enter a username and password. And so most reasonable users will enter a proper username and password. Of course, the bad guys don't do that. What the bad guys do is they will enter a username that looks like this. Uh, to many of us, it might look like rubbish, but for, for those of you that are technical, you'll, you'll see that this is actually a database command. And they, the bad guy can enter something for the password. It really doesn't matter what. And so you might ask, well, why would this uh, do anything? Why is this a threat? How, how does this result in uh, you know, bad things happening? So let me, let me explain that. So most websites uh, work uh, kind of as follows, where there might be a user that's using a web browser. That, web, uh, th that uh, user that's using the web browser enters a username or password into the browser. That username and password gets transmitted to a web server. The web server needs to figure out, is this a authentic user or this, is this an illegitimate user? And so what the web server does is it constructs a database command that does a lookup in the database to see whether or not the username and password are indeed authentic. So for those of you that know SQL, the structured query language, uh, you'll, you'll notice this is a SQL query. And it says, basically, get me the password from the place in the database that stores all the users where the username happens to match the username that was provided on the web page. Now, while uh, this is how things work normally, you can imagine that when the bad guy enters the database command as the username, that string gets substituted in for this variable. And what happens is that what used to be just a lookup to the database uh, becomes more than that. Uh, because of the way that this uh, malicious input is structured, it ends up actually uh, not querying for any users. Uh, or it, uh, rather, it issues a query, but uh, that query probably doesn't return anything. But the rest of the input makes up a database command that says, delete all the information about all the users from the database. Right? And so the database, of course, uh, will go ahead and execute this. And uh, everything, um, everything is now blank. So this is an example of what's called the denial of service attack, whereby any user, any legitimate user that tries to log in after this point uh, will end up not being able to log in. So this is an example of 
how you can uh, do bad things to, to a database. Of course, you can imagine that this isn't the only bad thing you could do to the database. I could, once I have this capability, I can steal information from the database, I can uh, you know, uh, put or alter information in the database, so that, that, that's a pretty bad deal. So uh, for those of you that uh, are in the technical community, you know that there's ways to prevent these kinds of attacks. I, I won't uh, walk through those types of preventions. I, of course, talk about those types of preventions uh, in my book. But uh, let, me, let me go on and uh, tell you about um, some additional bad things that can happen. So uh, b before I talk about uh, some other, other types of hacking threats, I just want to mention that the particular threat that you've seen is called SQL injection, and it's so popular uh, and so well known that uh, there's even cartoons about it, right? So for those of you that uh, read the cartoon, you'll see that uh, this is a case where a high school student was mucking around with the, probably the grades database or something like this, and uh, the mother gets a call. Uh, of course, um, you know, uh, the, the mother has no sympathy for the school, and they should protect their database a little bit better. So, uh, so, so that's one type of bad thing that can occur. Another type of bad thing that can occur is, uh, instead of that SQL injection, there's another attack called uh, cross-site request forgery. And let me just uh, set up the scenario, and I'll try not to get uh, too overly technical. But imagine the following scenario. Imagine that uh, a user, a good user named Alice, uh, logs into her bank, right? So she goes to her site, uh, bank.com. She probably wants to check her bank balance. And the way that most websites work is that on the front page, you may enter, say, your username and password. And what, uh, what, what the website will do is the, the website doesn't want you to have to enter your username and password to view every single page on the site. So what it does is it gives you back, uh, it gives your browser something called a cookie. How many of you have heard of a cookie? And how many of you are non-technical and have heard of a cookie? OK, good. So, so this is one of the things that, that cookies are used for. Um, now, in, in this particular attack scenario, what happens is that Alice may be logged into her bank in one browser window, and in another browser window, she may get lured to an evil website. And there's lots of ways to get lured to an evil website, right? You could receive an email, and there might be some kind of malicious link in the email. You happen to click on the link, and it takes you off to a malicious page. Well, let's see what kind of bad things can happen when a user happens to be logged in to their bank, and in another window, they get lured to the bad guy's site. So let me just uh, review what, what happens here in the good case. Uh, in the good case, Alice uh, contacts her bank, and her bank gives her back a web page that says, please log in. Please provide me with your username and password. So Alice says, OK, I want to log into my bank. I will provide the username and password. So once Alice provides the username and password, her computer makes a request to bank.com and uh, provides uh, her username Alice, and her password is I love Bob. Um, what bank.com does is bank.com looks up the username and password in their database and sees whether or not this user is indeed authentic. And uh, it, in this case, it is Alice. She's a good user. Her password really is I love Bob.com. And so what the bank does is says, oh, okay. Uh, this is an authentic user. Let me go ahead and give Alice a cookie so that when her browser makes subsequent requests, I can know it's Alice and I don't have to require her to type in her username and password again. So, uh, so she receives that uh, web page saying you've logged in successfully. And then let's say that she wants to view her bank balance. What the browser does is it makes a request to uh, bank.com after she clicks on the link to view her balance. And because Alice is logged into bank.com and the bank.com site gave her this cookie, her browser gives the cookie back to the server. And the, the bank.com server says, oh, I've seen this uh, session ID before. I've seen this cookie before. I just gave it to Alice. It must be Alice who wants to see her bank balance. And so I'll tell her that her bank balance is $25,000. Right? So this is how things work in the, in the good case. Uh, so she is logged in to bank.com in one window. Let's say in another window, she gets lured to an evil site. Let's look at what can happen. So in, um, in this case, things uh, start off as before. You know, she logs in. She, gets, she goes to her bank website. She gets a page that asks her for the username and password. Uh, she provides the username and password. She gets back the cookie. 
uh, except what happens now is let's say that she gets lured to the evil site in some other window. Well, her browser makes a request to the evil site because that's where she got lured to, and the evil site might send back a web page to her. Now, web pages are very interesting things, right? Web pages uh, you know, can include images, they can include text, they can include movies, they can include all kinds of things. And the way the web works, one of the great things about the web is that one web page can include images and text and stuff from all kinds of other websites in one page, right? So for those of you who have built websites, you probably use this feature of the web all the time. Of course, what happens in this case is that uh, when her second browser window gets lured to evil.com, evil.com sends her a web page back that uh, has an image in it. And this image, uh, what evil.com tells her browser is that this image that you should retrieve for me is on the bank.com site. And to retrieve this image, you should execute this pay bill program on the bank site. And by the way, here's some uh, parameters that you should provide to the pay bill program. Um, so what happens? Um, Alice's browser uh, you know, was, uh, was lured uh, to this other site, and Alice's browser wants to faithfully render the web page for Alice. So what does Alice's browser do? Alice's browser makes a request to bank.com. Now, because Alice is already logged into bank.com, in addition to making the request to run this pay bill program, uh, because it's already logged into bank.com, it also supplies the cookie. So bank.com gets this request that says, pay a bill, send the bill, send a check of $10,000 to 123 Evil Street, and it also sees that the cookie is there. And to bank.com, this looks completely authentic. So what does the bank.com server do? It goes ahead and issues, issues the check uh, to, to 123 Evil Street, and Alice just got $25,000, or in this case, $10,000 stolen out of her bank account. Now, you can imagine that the bad guys need to be a little bit smarter than this, right? Because if I'm the bad guy, and I have all these checks coming to me, <laughs> uh, and I go cash them, then you know, someone's going to find out and turn me in. So if I'm a bad guy, what do I do? Well, I, I start up a whole bunch of websites where I put out job advertisements for companies that don't really exist, and I recruit people for pay-at-home jobs, you know, work out of home. Um, you know, you need to have some set of skills. We require you to have an internet banking account. We require you to be able to receive checks. And basically, they'll have those folks uh, deposit these checks. They tell them, you keep a 10% for yourself, and then just transfer the rest to us. So what the, what the bad guys have done here in the, in the online world is they've hired a bunch of mules to end up uh, siphoning money to them. So this is another type of attack um, on the web. So, uh, so let's see. So that, that's, uh, how many of you think this is scary? Yeah. Um, so the question is, what do we do about it, right? Uh, well, I'm going to talk initially about what um, software developers and software managers can do about it. If you're, if you're a software developer, w one of, the, one of the, the, the issues in the education programs for computer scientists and software developers is they typically don't require you to take courses in security when you get your degree. And the, the, the problem is that you know, you'll graduate, you'll go to a company, you may not be aware of how the bad guys are going to try to manipulate the code that's going to be running on uh, your company's website. And uh, you know, so it's important to become educated about, about these things. Um, my hope is that over time, universities will start teaching this and start requiring it. Uh, but I think that process will take time. Uh, so if you're, a, if you're a software developer, you should arm and educate yourself. Ideally, it would be good to, to, to be in a position where every software developer knows about security so that uh, everyone can be vigilant when they're writing websites and writing programs. Um, but uh, you know, even, even if you're at that point, uh, and certainly if you're before that point, it makes sense to, to on each project, on each software project, elect, elect someone to be the software security czar. So they kind of keep an eye out for what are the bad things and how can the, the code and websites that you're building get abused. Uh, so, so that's what you can do if you're a, a software developer. Um, if you're a manager, it's extremely important to, when you're developing your software, to make sure that your software development process is instrumented for security. And that's an important component. I'll talk about that in just a second. 
It's also important to organize uh, initiatives in your company for security. So it might make sense to have, uh, you know, one to have there be a group of uh, security advisors internally at your company that can. Uh, advise other projects about security. Uh, it might make sense to take, if you have people that have experience in security, to uh, put the, embed them in various projects around the company and serve as satellites. Right? Uh, one model that has not worked well is uh, a model where you take all your security people and put them in one department and turn them into the gatekeeper for all the programs and projects that come out of the company. There's simply no way that a, that a, that a, that a small group of security engineers running as a gatekeepers can secure all the applications coming out of the company. Uh, so, so, so you need to organize for security. And it's also to, important to invest in training so that um, for, for those uh, developers that are in your company that didn't know about security, they can learn about it. And even for those that are, you need to make sure to keep them continually up to date and trained. Why? Because all the attacks are changing. And so it's important to, 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 to learn about the new attacks. It's also important to, to, to give them a paranoid mindset and teach them how to think in a paranoid way about every possible thing that could uh, go wrong. So let me, uh, I, I mentioned uh, instrumenting development processes for security. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Actually, um, and I'm going to illustrate that with this uh, picture. Um, uh, I'm actually very honored that, uh, th well, this picture comes from a book by uh, Gary McGraw called Software Security. I'm honored that Gary McGraw is here in our, uh, in our audience today. Um, and uh, if you hear someone heckling, it may be him. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but the, the idea here <laughs> is that you know, for those of you that are familiar with software development processes, uh, they're typically developed. Um, they're typically organized into a couple different steps, right? So you might have a step which requires you to gather requirements about how and what kind of features you would like to put into your software system. There might then be a stage where you come up with the architecture and design. At later points, you, you write test plans, you write the program code, you write the software code, you test the code, and then you push it out and you get feedback from the field. And the important thing is that at each of these steps, there's various things that you should be doing to ensure that the software products that your company is producing will be secure. So in the requirements phase, for instance, you should not just be thinking about What's the functionality of the system? What do I want the software to do? But I also want to, I should also talk about what do I not want the software to do in the case that somebody's trying to abuse it. So you should come up with a bunch of abuse cases. Uh, you should also develop various types of uh, security requirements, right? Think about uh, different types of attacks that someone might try to conduct against your system and how, how would you like to, to, to deal with that? What, what are the requirements? Uh, in, in the architecture phase, it's important to analyze the risks. It's important to test for those risks. When you're at the code stage, it's important to use things like uh, static analysis tools and dynamic analysis tools, maybe even that help identify uh, potential security vulnerabilities in the code. Um, of course, when you have a system that has been developed, you might want to do what's called a penetration test. So the idea is that like, if you compare this to, to your house, you want someone to look at both the outside and the inside of your house and look at where the doors are and look at where the windows are and try to think about what does the attacker need to do to break in. Um, you know, should I move the window higher, et cetera? You want to do these kinds of things. Uh, and penetration testing can also use a bunch of automated tools to help try automated break-ins. Uh, so there's a, a number of things that uh, I'd encourage engineering and software managers to do to instrument their life cycles for, for security. So I've talked uh, a bit about, uh, I've talked a bit, little bit about uh, these hack the, the way that hacking takes place. Most of the ways that I've uh, showed you are due to um, what's called web application vulnerabilities, uh, vulnerabilities in uh, web uh, applications. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift gears a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about malware, but then I'm going to tell you a little bit about how these two things are related. So how many of you know what malware is? OK, good. Um, so, so malware is basically malicious software programs that are written to do bad things. They're typically written by cyber criminals. Uh, actually, it used to be the case that maybe three, four, or five years ago, this kind of malicious software was, was written by teenagers who wanted to get a little bit of fame for themselves and have their virus or worms spread throughout the internet. But one of the key changes that's occurred over the past three or four years is that since there's a lot more commerce taking place online, um, the bad guys are going to want to make sure they get their cut too. 
And so they have become the primary authors of malware. And so if you look at uh, what are the kinds of things that malware do these days, instead of just kind of spreading from machine to machine, they are doing things like logging all of your keystrokes. So once your computer gets infected, uh, that software will effectively uh, log, uh, write down in some file, uh, every keystroke that you type. So this means that when you log into a website or you provide any type of credential, that malicious piece of software gets uh, all of the uh, usernames and passwords that you say happen to type in. So that's, that's one bad thing that malware can do. Another bad thing that malware can do is that it can, once it infects your computer, it can have your computer join a network of other compromised computers. So what the, what the cyber criminals do is that they, they infect a whole bunch of computers, and then they have them connect to some servers that they control. And they can basically then have those servers send out commands of their own choice uh, to all those infected machines. So that um, they can, for instance, uh, you know, some people ask, well, why is spam such a big problem, right? Can't you just cut this off at the server or something like this? Well, part of the problem is that there's a whole bunch of uh, malicious, uh, or there's a whole bunch of compromised uh, client machines on the internet, you know, people's home PCs that send, that serve as the relays to forward spam around the internet. And so that's a, another type of thing that malware will do once it's uh, on your machine. I could go on and on about all the things that malware does, but um, I, um, you know, and feel free to ask me about that afterwards, but uh, instead of what I'm going to talk about is how malware has, uh, has changed with regard to distribution, right? So it used to be the case that when you got infected with, say, a worm or a virus, what the worm or virus would try to do is it would try to spread to, say, other computers on your local area network, right, within your company. Or what it would do is it would look at all the contacts in your, in your Outlook uh, mail application and then forward itself to all the people in your address book. Um, what's fundamentally changed about the way that malware is distributed is that the bad guys realize that the web has actually become a much better platform for spreading malware. So you could imagine that if there's some popular websites, um, if I can somehow infect those websites so that everybody that visits those websites gets infected just by visiting the website, then you know, if a million people hit a particular website, I can just infect a million people. And so this is effectively what is happening. Uh, the distribution of malware has now changed to, to the web. So what the bad guys will do is they will break into websites. And whereas they used to, for instance, deface the front pages, right? After I break into a website, I, I put up my logo and I put up my name and say, hey, I hacked this website, cool. This would happen very often with government websites. Uh, the bad guys don't do that anymore. What they do, or they still do it, but not as much as uh, uh, the other things I'm going to talk about. Basically, what they'll do is instead of defacing the front page or defacing any of the pages on the site, they'll leave what's on the pages there. And they will just add, you know, a little snippet of code that will go source in some extra content from servers in Russia, China, uh, and basically download malware to your computer when you visit the web page, no user interaction required. So when you get to an infected web page, you don't click on anything, you don't download anything, simply visiting the web page will infect your computer. And this is how, this is how the bad guys are now distributing malware. So, uh, so, so, so this gets uh, actually really bad. Um, you know, you might, you might ask, well, if a, if, a, if, a, if a cyber criminal has to kind of break into one web server at a time, it might take them a lot of time to, 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 to compromise lots of machines on the web. It might take them a lot of time to infect lots of people. Well, what they've done effectively is they have automated their attacks. So what the bad guys will do is they will first uh, abuse search engines, they will make queries to uh, you know, the search engines that you're, you're familiar with, and they will ask questions like, give me a list of all websites that, say, happen to be running um, you know, some vulnerable database server. right? Um, and when the attackers get back these lists of sites that are running, say, vulnerable database servers or vulnerable web applications, what their programs will do after it gets back the list of vulnerable sites is that it will issue automated attacks to inject some of the malicious code that I showed on the previous slide into the databases on those websites. 
Now, many, many websites effectively dynamically generate their content, dynamically generate their pages based on information in databases. So if the database has this malicious code in it and it gets spit back on every web page that's shown on that website, you can imagine that this is a pretty effective attack platform. Uh, pretty much any user that comes to view pages on infected sites will now get infected just by viewing the page. Uh, and once the malware is on there, it can log the user's keystrokes or do whatever they would like. Um, in fact, um, what, the, what, 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 the, what, what these guys do, what the subcriminals do, is they assemble these botnets, right? And the botnets uh, get rented out. So, so, so somebody may infect a whole bunch of web pages. They may get a whole bunch of infected uh, user machines. And uh, then they will go onto underground chat networks, and they'll trade with each other. Some guy will say, hey, I have 100,000 infected machines. What would you like to do with them? Somebody else would say, hey, you know, I'd like to log all the user's keystrokes. And so they kind of trade. And, uh, well, what's the payment? Uh, some guy says, oh, I have 10,000 stolen credit card numbers. So I'll trade you the 10,000 stolen credit card numbers for access to 10,000 machines. Uh, I'll use those machines to get more credentials, and then it'll allow me to, you know, get more credit card numbers. It's kind of a, a crazy cycle. So, so, so this is what uh, the cyber or criminal community is doing. Uh, so, um, what, are we, what are we doing about it? Um, let me now talk about, um, uh, uh, for instance, how Google is helping. So, some of you may have noticed that when you do searches on Google uh, these days, if you happen to enter certain keywords, and I've left off the keywords uh, for this particular search intentionally, but uh, you, might get back, you might get back a list of uh, search results, and some of those results now, uh, due to features that Google has built in, will label some of these sites and say, this site may harm your computer. And if a user tries to click on that link, I mean, basically, Google thinks that if uh, the user goes to this website, their computer may very well get infected by malware just by viewing the page. And so if the user tries to click this link, Google says, you know, we're really not kidding. This site <laughs> will infect your computer. And so, uh, so, so for, for, for users, um, it's, uh, it's important not to go to these sites. You know, take, take the warning seriously. Um, let's see. For, for webmasters, you can imagine that for websites that get infected in this fashion, it's, it's very, very painful, right? And so what I'd encourage them to do is sometimes it's not even clear uh, they probably, you know, the, the, the website owners didn't do anything wrong, right? Uh, they didn't do anything malicious themselves, but their site just got infected because it had some vulnerability. And so what they should do is they should go to stopbadware.org, uh, which is a uh, nonprofit uh, consortium organization, uh, and there's various discussion groups at stopbadware.org. At stopbadware.org, they can join a discussion group, and uh, if, if, they, if, they, if they need help, uh, you know, cleaning up their site, uh, they can post messages there, and there's a community that can that can help them. So that's um, that's what you should keep in mind. This is what Google is doing to help protect you while you're searching your computer. One of the things that I should also mention is that while Google protects you while you're searching on Google and you know seeing search results, Google also supplies the list of infected sites to uh, various uh, third parties. For instance, there's a companies that make web browsers. And so this list of infected sites is provided to uh, organizations that, that build web browsers. And so this way, when you're browsing anywhere else on the internet, you know, not just searching, but when you're browsing anywhere else on the internet, your browser can protect you from sites that may be infected with malware by taking advantage of this list of, of malicious sites. Um, or not, not malicious sites, but rather infected sites. So some of you that are technical may wonder, well, how does Google do this? How do you figure out what are all the infected websites in the world? Well, uh, as you probably know, in order to get you the search results that Google does, Google needs to have a big index, has to have a, a big repository of all of the web pages, right? And what Google does is it, it runs what's called a, a MapReduce job to look through all of the web pages and look for signs of funny things going on. So for instance, if a website has some obfuscated JavaScript on it uh, and it looks a little bit fishy, then what, uh, what uh, Google will do is it'll compile a list of suspicious 
web, suspicious URL, suspicious websites, and it will kick off a bunch of um, machines uh, and load these URLs in these machines. These machines are actually virtual, they're not real, they're running in a big uh, server farm, but the idea is that inside of this uh, uh, virtual machine on one of Google servers, it loads this URL. And what it looks for is, for instance, if this virtual machine was uh, clean and you know fresh, and after viewing this web page, the machine is now, uh, there's a new program running on it that wasn't supposed to be there, this is a clear sign that it's bad. So it takes that list of um, you know, suspicious URLs, tests out each of the URLs, figures out which ones are really bad, um, and creates a repository of malicious pages. And then, of course, when a search takes place, uh, all of the search result links are looked up in this malicious page repository. And if it appears in the malicious page repository, uh, Google will say, this site may harm your computer. So that's how that, that works for, for those of you that are a bit more technical. So, uh, so anyhow, so I've, I've, talked, um, I've talked about... Uh, you know, uh, malware distribution, um, and uh, you know the way that um, the way that uh, web application vulnerabilities and hacking things are related is because of the fact that the bad guys are taking um, advantage of vulnerabilities in websites to effectively infect them with this malware drive by download code. So the, the, these two things are linked. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, tell you about some of the some of the more recent attacks. Uh, so these malware drive-by downloads attacks have been taking place since uh, you know early 2007 and maybe even a little bit earlier. And Google's been uh, you know blacklisting such sites for about that time. But let me tell you about some of the new things that the bad guys are doing. Um, Let's see. So the bad guys uh, don't just do uh, technical attacks. They they have to they have to be pretty smart. They use a technique called social engineering to make their attacks more significant. And so, you know, in one of the attacks, they have um, you know sometimes they might need to get you to click on an imposter site. They may need you to to get you a web page. And these are some of the the headlines that uh, they've been using. So they'll send out emails to people and they'll say breaking news you know and the emails might say come from uh, MSNBC and it says breaking news abortions outlined in California uh, abortion is outlawed in California or uh, you know Google launches free music downloads in China I mean some of this stuff is just a, a little silly but uh, you can imagine that uh, things like McCain gives up fighting for the presidency might encourage a lot of people to, to become interested in the message and so what, uh, what, what they'll do, and actually this, uh, th this was pointed to me by uh, Amit Patel, who was um, one of Google's first 10 employees. Um, he, uh, he, he pointed me to, to a blog which had some of these pictures. Basically, um, this is an example of, a, of an email message that comes supposedly from MSNBC that arrives in your inbox. And it looks uh, it looks pretty legitimate, right? It has a it has a bunch of text. It tells you about some breaking news. You know, it has a bunch of links in it. It has some links at the bottom. This link here at the bottom uh, will really go off to Microsoft's uh, privacy web page. This link here will really go to a place which lets you suppose you know unsubscribe from a list. Um, what 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 this link does, and of course this is the link that's right below the headline that everybody clicks on, is it will take you to not a, you know, many of you that are familiar with phishing attacks are familiar that if you click on such types of links, it might take you to a page that looks like your bank's website and try to encourage you to type in your username and password, right? Well, the bad guys have decided that's too much work. I can infect you easier. What I do is I get you to just click on this link and then I'll take you to an infected website. And that infected website installs malware on your machine. And then once the malware is installed on your machine, it can basically log all of your keystrokes. They don't need to get you to any site. So this is an example of how the bad guys are combining social engineering together with phishing and malware drive-by downloads to, to create uh, uh, havoc on the internet. So I've uh, told you, but of course, you know, if, you, if you say use a browser that uh, has the anti-malware protections um, you know, provided by, say, Google's, uh, Google's list of uh, you know, infected websites, then you would be protected. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell you about, uh, say, a dozen things that you can do to protect yourself online. Let me, let me walk through these. So what can you do? So how many of you have wireless routers at home? 
how many of you, when you got it, um, plugged it in and connected to it? About half of you. What did the, what did the other half of you do before you started using it? You hopefully changed the router's default username and password, right? Uh, the reason this is important is because there's an attack where if you don't change the, um, the password for your router, effectively the way you administer and manage your router is uh, the, the router has a little website built into it. And so what the bad guys can do is they can take advantage of vulnerabilities in that website that's used to manage your router and do things like change some of the very basic settings that your router uses to connect to the internet. Right? Once, the, once the bad guys have, have done that, you know, then even if you enter bankofamerica.com correctly in the browser address bar, uh, if the attacker has changed some of those fundamental settings that are used to connect to, uh, to the internet, they could take you wherever they would like. So for those of you that are, are more technical, uh, you know that um, when you type in bankofamerica.com into a browser, that really means nothing to your, to your machine. That name needs to get translated to an IP address, kind of like a telephone number on the internet, to figure out how to connect your computer to the computer you really want to communicate with. And so uh, what the bad guys do is they take advantage of um, vulnerabilities in the websites used to administer your routers to change the, uh, the DNS servers that are used to translate those names to the IP addresses. So change your default router password. Also, we talked about, um, we talked about uh, WEP, which is the security protocol that TJX attempted to use to protect the credit card numbers while in transit over wireless. Uh, so one thing you should do is don't use WEP on your router. Instead, use a protocol called WPA and choose a password. And so you'll, you'll choose a password on the router, and then you choose a password on your computer, uh, and it'll be able to communicate securely. So use WPA. You should also use a personal firewall. You should always keep it on. If a dialog box ever comes up saying, would you like to shut off your personal firewall, or can I shut it off you know, just for a couple seconds or whatever, you should probably say no. Right? So use a personal firewall. It'll help defend your computer against what are called network layer attacks on the internet. Um, use uh, antivirus. Use good antivirus. Uh, antivirus, uh, you can actually get it for free. You can go to sites like pack.google.com and you can get uh, Norton Security Scan uh, to, to, to help defend your computer against viruses. Uh, it's important to, if your antivirus package says, hey, I need an update. I need to go out to the antivirus server and get some updates. You should interrupt whatever you're doing and let it do that update. And the reason is, what the bad guys do is they sometimes target vulnerabilities in the antivirus software itself. So if you have a particular antivirus package running, the bad guy can take advantage of a vulnerability in the antivirus package and take over your computer that way. So if your antivirus package ever tells you, hey, I need to run out to uh, my server to get an update, you should listen. Uh, in addition to keeping your antivirus up to date, you should always keep your operating system up to date. So what happens is that whenever there's you know, critical enough of a thing, uh, Microsoft will uh, issue an update and you know, uh, have, your, have your computer get rebooted. But uh, even, even for other types of updates, if you get that little box that pops up and says, uh, hey, there's a critical security update or there's any other kind of an update, it's probably a good idea to, to update your operating system because the bad guys are uh, you know, continuously running all kinds of scanners and malicious programs on the internet that are trying to break into machines. So always auto-update. You should also, you know, it, it's, it's important to do everything you can to protect your computer. At the same time, something can go wrong. And it, it might not just be security related, but your hard drive might crash, all kinds of things could go wrong. So I'd uh, strongly encourage making backups uh, and or using a backup service. It's just a, a prudent thing to do. Uh, I mentioned malware drive by download attacks. I mentioned uh, that uh, there's some browsers that have malware protection built in. I would encourage you to use a browser that has malware and phishing protection built in. So Firefox 3, for instance, pulls a list of infected sites from Google um, on a daily or more often basis. And so that way, when you're browsing around the internet, the browser can help protect you against interacting with websites that may potentially infect your computer. So I'd encourage you to use that. 
By the way, I should mention that um, you know all these slides will be available at uh, LearnSecurity.com or off of my website at NeilDeswani.com. You can uh, you can uh, uh, download it from there. Um, you know, share it with whoever the IT administrator is in your home, <laughs> uh, whether it's your your your, your small son or uh, whoever it happens to be. <laughs> so uh, so what other things can you do to to protect yourself? You should not install software that you don't trust. So one of the issues with uh, certain operating systems, uh, you know, like Windows XP, for instance, is that when a piece of software gets installed on your machine, it gets full access to everything on your machine. It can do whatever it would like. And so you know, if there happens to be some cool freeware or shareware package, you know, unless it's coming from a, a reputable company and or you trust them from, for some reason, uh, you know, you should you should not download and install it because you're actually giving it lots of lots of privileges. And in, in, in the security world, we have a principle called the principle of least privilege. And the idea is that uh, you should only give a, a program, or in fact, a person, uh, enough privileges to do exactly what they need to do and no more. Right. So, for instance, when you drop your car off at the valet, you give the valet the valet key. Why? You don't want them to open your trunk and take whatever's in it. Right. Uh, operating systems are getting better, but Many operating systems today will let programs do whatever they want, um, even though you only probably want that program to do a certain set of limited things. Uh, another recommendation is to uh, use bookmarks for financial sites. So the idea is that if you type bankofamerica.com really quick, let's say you're in a rush to check your bank balance, you might mistype it, and you might get sent to some site that you think is bankofamerica.com. It looks like bankofamerica.com, but it's really not. So one way to deal with this is to, uh, at some time when you're relaxed, well rested, <laughs> type in bank of, uh, bankofamerica.com, make sure that it's uh, correct, um, and then set up a bookmark. And then whenever you access a financial or such a site, use the bookmark to access it. And that way you know that it got uh, entered correctly. Let's see, when you get to uh, secure sites like banking sites or brokerage sites or even potentially your email, if you log in using SSL, uh, how many of you know what SSL is? Um, it's the protocol that's used when you have that little lock at the bottom or at the side of your browser. Um, you should, uh, you know, once you log in and, you know, you're about to, to or you, once you're, even, even before you log in, when you see the username and password fields on the page, you know, check that it's uh, SSL, check that there's a lock there. Don't enter your username and password if there's no lock there. Uh, you should, uh, if your computer gets to a website and says, I'm going to this website, I'm trying to connect to it using SSL, um, and it pops up a warning saying, uh, there's something seems to be wrong with the web server. Its certificate does not seem to be valid. Uh, do not continue interacting with the site, right? If it's, if it's a reputable website, they should be worrying about making sure they have updated certificates and security credentials on the site to prove to your browser that it's, it's okay to interact with it. So don't, don't ignore security warnings. Um, let's see, you should of course uh, use good passwords, right? So um, uh, what, what is a good password? Uh, a good password is typically not something that you'd find in the, a word that you'd find in the dictionary. It's uh, not a street name. It's not, um, you know, any, any because the, the way to think about this is that, you know, if, if, if you thought about hacking, right, you're like, okay, well, a bad guy can try a whole bunch of usernames and passwords and try to break into my account, try to guess my password, but of course, the bad guys use automated tools. So they don't just try one password at a time, they'll have a program tries, trying a million passwords within a second. Computers are really fast. Microprocessors can do things really fast. So you need to choose a password that's very, very hard to guess, right? Um, w one recommendation is you can kind of, um, you know, uh, think of a quote that you might like and that, uh, that might not be very common. So one quote um, that I like, and I didn't happen to, you know, choose my password based on this quote, but <laughs> the, <laughs> the quote is, but let's say the, you know, the quote is by uh, J.M. Barry. It's, um, um, basically, uh, let's see, so it, it, it's only work if you'd rather be doing something else, right? So what you could imagine doing is taking, you know, the first character of each of the uh, words in that quote and using that to construct your password, right? Maybe throw in a, you know, an extra number in there or something like that. So, so come up with a good password. Uh, in addition to coming up with a good password, many of you use websites that, if you forget your password, allow you to reset your password using a, a password reset functionality on the website. And they, the way these things work is they'll ask you some kind of security question, 
right? They'll say, what was the name of your dog? Or what was the name of your pet? Something like that. Um, it's important that most websites allow you to choose either what you want your security question to be, right? Completely a choice, or they'll choose a couple ones. So it's important that when you decide what you would like your password reset answers to be, uh, I mean, you should choose um, questions that other people wouldn't know about you. So let me go ahead and give an example. Um, how many of you heard that Paris Hilton's phone got hacked, like back in 2004? How many of you have heard that, right? Let me tell you how that, how many know how that hack, hack happened? Okay. Um, so the way the hack happened is that Paris Hilton had, had a pet, right? And so, you know, you might imagine that her username might be something like P. Hilton, right? And I think she, I don't know if she was using T-Mobile or what, what the wireless carrier was, but uh, she basically had a password reset question. Her password reset question like was, what was the name of your pet? Or what was the name of your cat or dog or something like this? Well, how do I find out what's the name of Paris Hilton's pet? Open any magazine. Open any magazine or do a search using Google, <laughs> right? So what the bad guy does is says, oh, my username is P. Hilton. I've forgot my password. Uh, the attacker gets the password reset question. The password reset question is, what's the name of your pet? Oh, just enter a search on Google, find out the name of Paris Hilton's pet, and now I can reset Paris Hilton's password to be whatever I want it to be. That's how the bad guy got Paris Hilton's, uh, broke, into their, broke into her phone, got her contact information, got the numbers of all her friends. So, so, so it's not important to, to just use good passwords, but you need to choose good password reset questions too. When you do online transactions, uh, you can, uh, for instance, use a credit card. Um, your credit card company might want to give you a really big limit. Your credit card company might be like, okay, I'll give you a $20,000 limit. You should probably, uh, you know, for the credit card that you're going to do for online, or that you're going to use for online transactions, choose a lower limit. So that way, if God forbid the card number is ever stolen, uh, you know, the, the, the limit is uh, thresholded. But also, when you do transactions using credit cards, your liability is limited to $50 uh, or even less. Some, some, uh, zero. Zero. It's now zero. So, so that's uh, one thing you can do. You can also use what are called virtual one-time credit cards. So some banks, like Citibank, will let you download a package which will... Effectively, every time you want to do a credit card transaction, you can say, generate a new credit card number for me. And you can then enter that virtual one-time use credit card number into the site that you're interacting with. And that way, if that number happens to get stolen, it's OK. It's only valid for one use. So that's uh, another option. You know, I should mention that um, you know, this list of about a dozen or so things that you can do to secure yourself online, uh, I... Uh, you know, I, I, um, I'm a big fan of some of these practices myself. I also owe a lot to um, the, the, the set of security Jedis on uh, Google's security team. I kind of pulled them and asked them, hey, if I, I'm talking to a bunch of folks, what, what can I tell them? Uh, and so I, I really uh, thank that team for helping come up with this uh, list. Um, in general, in addition to, to, to doing these things, I mean, there's, there's something to keep in mind, not just, not just online, but probably offline as well, and that is... If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So if you receive an email from some prince in Nigeria, <laughs> right, <laughs> that wants help transferring money, <laughs> it's probably too good to be true. So in any case, I'm going to, I'm going to summarize. Um, to, to help protect ourselves from cybercrime online, there's a, a number of things that can be done. I'd encourage software people to, to learn more about security, uh, to, to organize appropriately within their companies, to do everything they can in their software code to prevent vulnerabilities. Uh, I've told you a little bit about Google is good, what Google is doing. Uh, when you search with Google, you're uh, going to be protected from being sent off to websites that might infect your computer. And if you use a browser with malware protection like Firefox 3, uh, Google provides them with a list that can help defend your computer there as well. And then I spent some time telling you about a dozen things that you can do to be vigilant. My hope is that if we all employ uh, a number of these measures, then we can all work together to help allow the internet to uh, continue to uh, uh, continue to uh, grow, um, you know, and allow us to do commerce, collaborate, and uh, communicate in perhaps ways that uh, we haven't even yet imagined. Thanks. Oh, and it. Uh
Looks like there might be questions, so I'd be happy to, to, to answer questions. Hi. If, if you guys could actually line up in the middle aisle, for those of you that want to ask questions, we'll have a mic back okay. there for you. Very good. In fact, um, and after I, after I take these questions, I might ask uh, some questions of my own and give out a couple of copies of my book, but let's take your questions first. Neil, as yes. a non-technical guy, uh, when I read about Estonia being, being subjected to, uh, to a cyber attacks from, from uh, nations unknown, and, and I, as I understand it, the, the recent incursion into the nation of Georgia was preceded by massive uh, cyber attacks. Uh, how, how, does that, how does that relate to what you're talking about? <laughs> Is there any, on that macro level, is there any really, any mm -hmm. defense to that? Are we vulnerable to that uh, the next time there's a 9-11 type incident? Uh, th th that's a question. Okay, so I'd, I'd be happy to answer the question. So there, there's many, many threats online, right? Um, I've talked about um, some things that are kind of within the purview of uh, software developers and, uh, and, and users and, and, and Google to help solve. Uh, there is, of course, the, the issue of a massive cyber attack. So there, there is a, an attack called a distributed denial of service, where what the bad guys do is they compromise a whole bunch of machines. They'll use a botnet, like I talked about earlier, except what they'll do is... Um, they will, once they compromise all those machines and say have compromised uh, 100,000 or more machines, they will then tell those machines to start de generating tons of traffic uh, and requests and data packets on the internet to effectively flood legitimate servers. And what happened, th that's exactly what happened in the case of Estonia. The bad guys launched a, a distributed denial of service attack. Um, with regards to cyber attacks in general, you know, these things are possible. Um, you know, when the, when the internet was designed, uh, it was designed as a trusted network initially, except what happened is it became very popular and successful faster than anyone could have imagined, including uh, Vint Cerf, uh, who, who was so kind as to uh, write the forward for, for, for my book. Um, let's see, uh, Dean Z. Galil uh, wrote an endorsement, which is, which is great. Um, but the, the, the issue is that um, the, the internet is still susceptible to distributed denial of service attacks. And the, um, the, the Department of Homeland Security, as well as a number of other government organizations, have started taking a lot more interest in these types of things. Um, so I, I, I can't say that there's an absolute uh, easy defense against this. Uh, basically, to defend against uh, distributed denial of service attacks, you need to make some changes at uh, network layer infrastructure at your routers and whatnot. Um, currently, uh, one of the best defenses is actually just to over-provision, to buy bigger routers that can handle so much traffic that even if someone generates, that they won't be able to generate enough traffic to overload it. Um, but clearly, we need, uh, you know, we need to deploy better defenses. There. There's been a lot of research uh, into techniques like IP traceback, um, but uh, you know, those, uh, those defenses haven't yet been, been fully deployed. So there's much work to be done to, to deal with uh, network layer distributed denial of service attacks. Gary? So just so you know, the DOD is actively interested in cyber defense. And, and cyber attack, too. And cyber attack, well, you know. <laughs> Thanks. Next question. So my understanding is that there's two major problems. Either they're trying to take over your computer and use it to process information or packets or, or software, or they're trying to steal your financial information. And it sounds like for the financial information, it's a couple of credit card companies. You're talking Visa, Master, Discover, JCB, Amex. That's pretty much 99% of credit cards in the world. Why or what, what are they doing since they're the ones that lose the money? So what, um, what, the, what, the, what the credit card companies have done is they have created a, a set of standards uh, through a group called the Payment Card Industry, PCI. And for any merchant that takes a credit card number online, they require that merchant to be PCI compliant. They basically have to follow a certain set of rules um, you know, and uh, pass audits. Uh, in order to, to continue to have the right to take credit card numbers. So uh, PCI compliance uh, has been having some effect. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that, uh, is that compliance doesn't mean security. You know, just because I can convince an auditor that I'm doing certain things doesn't mean I'm secure. It just means I'm complying with a certain set of rules. If there's, for instance, say a novel attack that comes out, you can, you can still be taken. Uh, so, so, so PCI compliance is a, is a step that the credit card companies are taking to help ensure that merchants are, uh, you know, attempting to be responsible with regards to taking credit card numbers. 
I, I have two short questions. The first, I, I think, might just be a yes or no question. Um, is bookmarking your financial websites um, any form of defense against sort of keystroke logging attacks since you wouldn't actually be typing in your institution's name or Right. So, so in answer to that, the um, you know bookmarking your financial institution websites will not defend you against um, you know certain types of attacks like keystroke logging. Right. Um, the the idea what it does defend you against is uh, say for instance you know you should if you always use those bookmarks and only use those bookmarks then if you supposedly get an email from your bank right and there's a link to, a supposed link to your website in the bank. You know, if you if you don't click on that link, but instead go to your bookmark, you'll know you'll hopefully, so long as you haven't been compromised in some other way, um, get to your bank's website and it's actually your bank. Um, I had mentioned things like um, changing your router password. Uh, make sure you do that because you know if you don't do that and you still use the bookmark, you could still end up at the at the wrong site. Okay. My, second question. My second question is also, I think, a pretty brief one. Um, is there a difference in security level between sort of the free or open source security software, antivirus software, and, and you know, the Nortons of the world? So I'll, I'll, I'll answer that, and I'll actually uh, paraphrase from a section in one of uh, Gary's books. Um, you know, open source versus closed source um, isn't, uh, doesn't usually uh, give you any security guarantees one way or the other, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, if you need to make an open source versus closed source decision, it's uh, something that you should decide based on the business model of your company, right? Uh, if I decide to make uh, some, some software open source so that supposedly other software developers can see the code and potentially look for security vulnerabilities in the code, you're hoping for a lot. You're hoping for, if they find the vulnerabilities, you're hoping that they tell you and that they don't exploit it. <laughs> um, and even if you have a closed source, it doesn't mean that your software is, isn't vulnerable to attack. Uh, it's pretty easy to reverse engineer binary code that is closed source. So if you're, even if you're, you're doing closed source, you should make sure to have security audits on your software done. So you know, open source versus closed source is actually orthogonal to security. Uh, Neil, thanks for spending this evening talking to us about this. Uh, Stephen Balfour, class of uh, 08, uh, Columbia Business School. Uh, Question. So we've been talking a lot about what you can do as a user to protect yourself. Um, I think the, the other side of the table is as the web continues to grow um, exponentially, uh, small businesses, you know, large, large enterprise businesses, or, uh, or other startups in, in between, what are some things that they can do as additional nodes enter the Internet to build uh, trust and, and, and join kind of the trusted side of the community? So the question is, what can uh, small, medium, and enterprises uh, do to, to help, uh, say, ensure security on their, on their websites? You know, it used to be the case that what security for a website meant was going to, say, VeriSign and getting a certificate for your, for your web server so that you could have an authenticated connection f for a user. Those days are long gone. Um, companies need to do a lot more. Um, you know, kind of the root cause of the problem is typically in, in application code that, uh, that you build for your website. And so it's important to, to, to do a number of things. It's important to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, instrument your software development lifecycle so that software that you're running that gets put on your website uh, you know, is, uh, is built using a process that facilitates security. Um, it's important to, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, it's important to train your engineers uh, to make sure that they understand how their software can be attacked by a SQL injection, cross-site request forgery, cross-site script inclusion, cross-site scripting. There's a whole host of these uh, types of attacks. Um, I should also mention that you know, the security of software is something that you, know, you can't exactly build software and then decide to make it secure afterwards. Security actually has a, you know, you know, things in common with quality. right? You can't de decide to build a product and then say, I want to make it a quality product after that. You kind of have to, the, the quality has to be inherent in the product that you build, uh, just like the security has to be inherent in the product that you build. So I, I, I'd say that it's important to, to, take those, um, to take those steps. There are other things that you can do. For instance, you can, um, if you're a website, and let's say that you've identified that your deployed code has some vulnerabilities, 
Um, and it might take you 60 to 90 days to fix those vulnerabilities because you, know, you have to fix it, you have to write the code for that, you have to test it, you have to deploy it. Um, one thing that you can do in the interim, instead of having your website be vulnerable to those issues for some amount of time, is you can deploy uh, something like a web application firewall. So it's a little bit different than a network layer firewall uh, because it looks at your web traffic specifically and it can help uh, defend against those attacks uh, as a stopgap uh, while you're fixing your software. So that's another thing that can be done. Hi. Um, this is concerning the malware. Uh, so you said that Google is uh, looking at websites and, and, and providing warnings. That's, that's a good step. Uh, you can use certain browsers. Some of us don't have choices because of corporate standards and that sort of thing. Uh, when you look at anti-spyware, they use often use some artfully vague language about protecting against malware. Um, in general, how effective is that against malware, the antiviral software? Oh, so, so how, how effective is antivirus software against malware? So I think antivirus software is, is is good to run with regards to how um, how it helps you know how it helps with regards to protection. Um, I'd say that you know it's it, it, it's a good defense, but antivirus software needs to get better. Um, so if you're if you're if evaluating a piece of antivirus software, uh, there there is an important question to ask. The important question to ask is given a unknown program, an unknown binary. If I provide it with the anti to the antivirus program, what's the probability that it's going to successfully detect whether or not it's bad? Um, that's the metric that you're interested in. Uh, there are th there's other metrics that are used in the community. Uh, so, for instance, some some folks attempt to study antivirus software by looking at a, you know a known set of malware and then running it through a bunch of scanners and figuring out what's the percentage that it detects known malware. And you know those percentages end up usually being pretty high, but the the, the percentages of you know what's the chance that's going to detect against the unknown threat, the unknown binary, uh, are typically lower. So I think that there there is uh, progress that needs to take place with regards to, um, to, to to having better antivirus technology. Gary. So just to add something there, um, the first thing that you do if you write a piece of malware is you buy a copy of all of the antivirus software, and you run your malware at your house against the antivirus software and see whether it gets by. And if it doesn't, you fix it. <laughs> so so, so, so you, should, you should fully expect that decent malware will not be trapped by uh, most antivirus software unless it's using some kind of heuristics, in which case it might not run programs you want to run, too. So it's you know, typical security is kind of a hard thing to get right. It's all lots of trade-offs, and that's one of the tricky ones. And the second question I had had to do with key, keystroke loggers. Mm -hmm. I've noticed... Um, on some sites, uh, specifically like ING Direct, they have numerical passwords where you have to click on the numbers. Is do keystroke loggers uh, monitor mouse clicks? Is that a security measure they're doing? So, that? so depending upon the sophistication of the keylogger, uh, some some older keyloggers typically just log the keystrokes. Uh, more sophisticated current day keyloggers will do things like observe when you are at a particular website. And they will take a screenshot um, when you happen to be at a bank's website, like at a. At a and uh, with regards to, to mouse clicks, yes, they can also record mouse clicks. You know, pretty much once a malicious piece of software is on your computer, um, it can see everything. So key, keystroke logging uh, malware has also been getting more sophisticated. Back in the '70s, shortly after BART opened, they realized that you could change the value of BART cards using a piece of audio tape and an iron set on permanent press. Uh, within the last month, they've talked about the way to hack the uh, MTA card in Boston, mm -hmm. uh, the fast track that's probably on your windshield if you go over any of the bridges in the Bay Area. What's your opinion about the value of publicizing these situations, especially after... Uh, the owner of the product or software was told about it confidentially and appears to have chosen not to do anything about it. So 
I think that it's important for, I think it is important to, 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 to talk about attacks and to focus on attacks. Um, because if you don't spend time thinking about attacks, then it becomes very hard or you might lose sight and build the wrong defenses, right? Um, that said, it's, it's also important to follow a responsible disclosure protocol, you know, to work with uh, vendors to give them the opportunity to fix things before you publicize things. I think uh, security researchers deserve the recognition and acknowledgement for their, for their work in bringing to the forefront certain security vulnerabilities. But it's also important to them that they should give, um, that they should give uh, you know, appropriate time. And sometimes the discussion uh, gets in a muck of uh, you know, the security researcher wants to deploy things faster than the company can, can fix it. Uh, but I think it is important for responsible security researchers to, to, to whatever extent they can, to work with the company to, to fix it and not just point out problems, but also help point out solutions and, and work to help provide um, solutions. So one quick further thing to add there, um, with regards to some of these cases, especially in Europe, um, part of the idea that the, the people that had done the bad system uh, tried to foist on the world was blaming the people who found the problem for the problem. Fortunately, there are some very smart judges who said, that's utterly ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Now, that's like putting the little boy in the emperor's new clothes in jail <coughs> and stay, instead of saying, hey, how about if we have some actual clothes on the emperor? Um, and I think that's probably what you were looking for. I, most, most security people believe that. So, you know, with, yeah. without I, I think reference to the other part. It's extremely important to, to not try to, you know, quell the security researchers because um, they're not the source of the problem. The product was the source of the problem. So fix the product. Uh, hi, Neil. Good talk. Um, I had one Good question shit. about the, going to a malicious website and having malware automatically download and install on your computer. Wouldn't this be a really easy thing to fix at the browser level? Why do the browsers you know, download and install software? So the question is, with, with regards to malware drive-by downloads, wouldn't this be easy to fix in the, in the browser? And uh, it, it, it's actually a little bit more complicated of, a, of an issue than that. Um, for instance, the way that some of this code works, this malware drive-by download code will, will work, is it will uh, include like an active X object that happens to be on the client computer uh, that may have a whole bunch of legitimate uses. But what the, you know, what the code will do is it'll mount, say, a buffer overflow attack against that uh, active X object. So while that active X object typically provides some useful functionality, uh, it can be taken advantage of. And so actually, in that case, the problem wasn't in the browser. It was in this ActiveX piece of software that was elsewhere on the, op on, on the computer. So is ActiveX the only way that um, you could get this drive-by malware? Uh, no. Well, so uh, it would be great if ActiveX was the only way, but there's Flash. There's a whole bunch of other plugins that are typically used to render web content, and uh, a vulnerability in any one of them can be, can be potentially taken advantage of. Okay, thanks. Hi, you mentioned that Google now finds out the uh, infected websites or the malicious websites and can prevent a user from accessing that web page. But uh, Google also knows the uh, other websites which are linking to that particular page and then the websites that are linking to those websites and there's a, like, a degree of separation from a good page to a bad page. So can Google also point out, like, uh, since you have all that inf information, can Google also like tell that you can uh, like give a score or some kind of a level of separation from a malicious website so, so, so I think the user I, does not go there? I, I think part of the problem here is that lots of legitimate good websites are getting infected. So, for instance, um, you know, the New York Times might get infected. And I don't mean to pick on the New York Times for any reason, but the New York Times might get infected. Lots of people are going to link to New York Times. New York Times is you know, pretty much a good site, except they had a couple of their pages hacked. Um, does that mean that I should penalize people that link to New York Times? Probably not. Right? So the, the, the problem is a little bit harder than that. Neil, thanks for the excellent talk. Um, a lot of small businesses are hosting their websites out in these uh, ISPs. And um, so if, if those websites get affected by uh, malware or whatever, um, <coughs> they might not be aware of that, but Google might pick that up and label that as you know, a bad one. And my question is that for those legitimate business who get labeled, what is the resolving procedure 
to ah. get the website out, and how do you deal with false positives, if you have any? Okay, so I should mention that, um, first of all, the, w when Google blacklists a site, um, there are almost no false positives. They're extremely rare. Google is very, very careful to, to, to make absolutely sure uh, that a website is infected if, it, if it's going to get blacklisted. Um, so, so Matt Cutts, um, who was uh, also one of our uh, early employees here at Google, has a very nice blog. Uh, and if you go to his blog and look at one of the recent entries, it talks about, um, it talks about that particular issue and, and how, um, you know, uh, and the false positive rate and such things. Uh, you know, so that answers the second part of your question. The first part of your question was, uh, what, you know, what should the websites do? Uh, the websites should go to stopadware.org. And at stopadware.org, for instance, there's instructions uh, where if your website got infected, here's a bunch of remediations that you can try. Um, so, so I'd encourage you to uh, go to stopadware.org, check out that website, as well as if your website happens to get infected and you're having trouble, join the discussion list and engage with the community there to, to help um, identify and resolve the problem. Thanks. Thank you very much to everyone. I'm sure there are still a lot of questions. And um, what we'd like to do is maybe continue the discussion. We still can have a drink and you know, grab something to eat. Thank you very much for all your attention. Can I uh, raffle off one book? Sure. Yes. Sure. <clears throat> so if someone, uh, yeah, please. <laughs> if someone can, can, can someone tell me who, what, was the first, what was the name of the first worm that was ever written on the internet? Oh. Gary, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> The Morris Worm, correct, written by Robert Morris. Give him a hand. Hey, for extra credit, what does Robert Morris do now? Uh, well, he, 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 he was, uh, I'm sorry, so, so who are you asking? Are you asking me or are you asking yeah, you, them? You. Well, he, uh, he's a professor, right, or a retired professor, right? So, yep. yeah, so, so I get a copy of my own book. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> he's teaching people how to code these days. It is junior, yeah. Okay. Seniors. Very good. Not a so, so with that, I'll hand things back over to Sunita, and uh, maybe we right. can... Right, I think, yeah, and I'm, time. we'll yeah. be very happy to continue discussing. I mean, Neil will, will still be around, and uh, please continue to have a, a great time, have some drinks, have some food. Um, once again, if you can have, take just a few seconds to fill in the, the feedback form before you leave, there's a box over there near the bottle, so just, you know, as, as you leave. And uh, we wish to see you again soon, and hope you enjoyed the evening. Thank you.